you will take your Bible once again with me and turn back to 1 Thessalonians. This time, chapter 5. We finished out uh, chapter 4 last week in a message that uh, was titled, The Rapture. Well, guess what follows the rapture? In chapter 5, we've titled this message, The Day of the Lord. The Day of the Lord. Now, as you're finding, once again, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and I hope you have your Bible that you can follow along because you'll get so much more out of it. If you are a Bible believer and you yourself search the scriptures to see, like the Bereans, whether these things are so, don't just take a man's word for it. Look and follow along in God's word yourself. One of the primary, can I call it a law? One of the primary laws of interpreting the Bible so as to understand it is this. Context is number one. The context is primary in understanding and properly interpreting the Bible. Now look at the context of this chapter 5. Just drop back to chapter 4, verse 17, and you'll see the context. Then... We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. In fact, in verse 18, he says, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Well, look at the 11th verse of chapter 5. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. So the context, I read that 17th verse in particular, is that believers in the future will be caught up to meet Jesus in the air. And now as we start chapter 5, what becomes clear is that that being caught up to meet Jesus in the air will happen before the day of the Lord, will happen before the 70th week of Daniel, or what is often just called the tribulation. What will become clear is that believers won't suffer through the coming tribulation because it wasn't designed for them. The day of the Lord, the tribulation period, was designed especially to purify the nation of Israel. In fact, in one reference in Jeremiah, it's called the time of Jacob's trouble. And it also is designed to judge the pagan nations. And so, how does the rapture of the church then relate to the day of the Lord? Well, I really believe, and I hope you're following me, because I want you to get this. I want you to understand this. I really believe that the sequence from chapter 4 to chapter 5 is vitally important. The passage about the day of the Lord, chapter 5, follows the passage about the rapture of the church. How is this going to happen? Well, this section that we're going to be looking at, chapter 5, 1 to 11, is all about the day of the Lord. And to understand the day of the Lord, he shares three aspects concerning it. Three things pertaining to the day of the Lord. I'll share those after we pause a moment, and let's have a word of prayer together once again. Heavenly Lord, thank you for the opportunity we have to meet together. Thank you that we have the Bible and that you give us light through it. You give us direction. You tell us not only how to live now, but you show us what is in store in the future. And I pray that we would not merely be hearers of your word, but doers of it. That we wouldn't miss the blessing that is attached to the application of your word in our personal lives. You know the condition of our need spiritually. Lord, whether we're unsaved and we need your saving grace to touch our lives today, we pray that you would work accordingly. If we are believers, we would have your sanctifying grace 
at work in our hearts. Grant it, Lord. We just ask that today you'd be pleased with everything that uh, we say and do here and that Jesus would receive the preeminence and not a man because it's all about him, it's through him, it's for him, and uh, it's to him that we ask these things for his sake. Amen. One of the first things that I would point out as we look at verse 1 in chapter 5, he begins by saying, but of the times and seasons, brethren. Notice he's talking to believers. Of the times and seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. Obviously, Paul has covered a lot of the information that he is going to reiterate and go over with them in just a few months that he had spent in the beginning stages of this local church in that ancient city of Thessalonia. But what he begins with here is really a contrast. He contrasts the rapture versus the day of the Lord. So the first aspect that I want to bring to your mind about the day of the Lord is that it is contrasted with the rapture. There, perhaps I need to begin by giving you a definition of this term that is used here, the day of the Lord. It's used in verse 2. He says, you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Let me define for you, let me give you a definition, just a brief one, of the day of the Lord. Basically, there are two facets or two phases of the day of the Lord. There is a past phase of the day of the Lord in which God in history intervened in the nation of Israel as well as the nations of the earth. You can find that spelled out. Just jot this down. I'm not going to take the time to turn and read there. Zephaniah chapter 1, verses 14 through 18. Okay? That's a past historical day of the Lord event. But the second phase or aspect of the day of the Lord is that it is a future event that has not yet happened. That it will... It will be something that will take place before, uh, after the rapture, but at the beginning, I should say, of the tribulation. You can find this, and again, I'm not going to turn there, referenced in passages, many passages, but for example, Isaiah chapter 2, verses 12 to 19. So the future event called the day of the Lord it, uh, it, it is the beginning of this tribulation period, which, of course, is a seven-year period. We know that from Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. It's called the 70th week of Daniel, which is a seven-year period of time. So the day of the Lord, it, uh, it begins with the tribulation, but it also includes the second coming of Jesus. The glorious second coming. Uh, Joel chapter 2, verses 30 to 32, says that that day includes the glorious coming of Jesus, his second coming. And then the third aspect, uh, rather, uh, the third part that is included in this future event called the day of the Lord is the millennium. And uh, that's Isaiah chapter 4, verse 2, and the entire 12th chapter. Okay, so let me review. How do we define the day of the Lord as it refers to the future? It is a future event that begins the tribulation, includes the second coming of Jesus, and also the millennium. Okay? That's what is included in this whole big umbrella term, the day of the Lord. However, follow me now, however... The day of the Lord, here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and, and uh, verses 1 to 10, is focusing primarily on the tribulation period, on that time of God's judgment on this earth and his chastening of the nation of Israel. Now, 
Verse uh, 1 begins with the word, but. And that, I, I want to show you a distinction here. That word, but, is actually two words in the original language in the New Testament was written in, and it simply means now. And the reason Paul has that word at the beginning of that first verse is that he is introducing a new subject. He's not talking about the rapture. He's talking about, as verse 2 says, the day of the Lord. And so to indicate that the day of the Lord doesn't include the rapture, he introduces it with that word. But now I want to talk to you about something else. I want to talk to you about the day of the Lord. By the way, we're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I think it's verse 51, that, uh, that the rapture in which our bodies will be glorified and changed instantaneously, will all be changed, is a mystery. What that means is the rapture was not revealed in the Old Testament scriptures. The rapture isn't revealed in what the Jewish people call the Tanakh. However, the day of the Lord is. The day of the Lord, as I've already uh, mentioned, is all over the Tanakh. It's all over the Old Testament. And so he is contrasting the difference between the rapture that is unrevealed in the Old Testament and the day of the Lord that is revealed in the Old Testament, which tells us this. Not only the sequence, but in what in his distinction that he is bringing about, he is trying to tell us that the rapture must occur before the beginning of the day of the Lord or the tribulation period. The rapture is not going to happen within the tribulation, nor happen at the end of the tribulation. The church is raptured before the tribulation, that's why it is called a pre-tribulation rapture. Okay. So that's the contrast, and that's the distinction that he's trying to make here. Now, in verses 2 and 3, I haven't lost you yet, have I? Not already. I haven't lost you yet. Are you with me? You know, I used to hate it when the teacher would say, you got your thinking cap on? Put your thinking cap on, right? Remember that? Yeah. That means you really have to use your brain. Will you hang with me and really think with me? Would you wake up this morning and get your Bible and follow along as much as you can? Because this is important stuff. This is stuff that you, that uh, will not only satisfy curiosity, it can change your life. Do you want that? So, first of all, the first aspect of the day of the Lord that he deals with is he, it, it's contrasted with the rapture. The second thing that he does is really uh, he, he informs. And so we're informed in verses 2 and 3. And look at how he begins. He says, you yourselves know perfectly, you know fully well, that the day of the Lord cometh as a thief in the night. For when they, not us, when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction shall come upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. First thing that he wants to inform us about is that the day of the Lord has nothing to do with the rapture. And I'll tell you why. Because the rapture, as we saw last week, is an event that is imminent. An event that can happen at any moment. No event has to happen before the rapture. And if some event has to happen before the church is raptured, then it is not imminent. And yet the whole New Testament and all of the churches and all of the writings of the New Testament writers present the rapture of the church as an imminent event that can happen at any moment. Nothing is hindering it from happening now. 
And so he's informing, and he says in verse 2, he's speaking to the brethren. Remember? In verse 1, brethren, he says to them, you yourselves know perfectly. You're informed already. You're cognizant. You know what I mean by cognizant? It means you're knowledgeable. You understand this. You're informed. What are you informed about? You're informed that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. It cometh. That means the day of the Lord begins this way. It begins, and it's a time of judgment. It, it, it concerns, the day of the Lord concerns times and seasons. That is, it concerns the, the duration and the characteristics, particularly of the beginning of this day of the Lord. That's one reason, again, why this has nothing to do with the rapture. The rapture isn't about times and seasons. The rapture isn't about signs and wonders in the skies. The rapture is simply something that happens at any moment when Jesus himself appears and Believers, the church is raptured, is caught up together to meet him, as verse 17 of chapter 4 says, in the clouds, in the air. But the day of the Lord, notice how it begins in verse 2. It comes or it begins as a thief in the night. It's like there is an apparent calm, and this day of the Lord is stealthy. You know what, what a stealth bomber is? It can evade it, it can evade radar and detection. So the day of the Lord, it comes as a thief in the night. It comes undetected. And the reason it comes undetected it is because the people who are going to suffer in the day of the Lord are not awake. We're going to see they're asleep. They are spiritually asleep. And so the day of the Lord overtakes them like a thief in the night, undetected because they're unawake. In fact, look at verse 3. For when they, not the brethren, they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them. Not talking about believers. It's the day of the Lord is a day of judgment. It brings sudden destruction as travail upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. So while we're informed here that believers are cognizant concerning the day of the Lord, unbelievers are ignorant concerning the day of the Lord. They are saying, verse 3, peace and safety. The day of the Lord, which is a day that brings sudden destruction upon unbelieving people on this earth, begins with great delusion. They're saying peace and safety. They're, in fact, the day of the Lord must, must be preceded by a time when the world feels secure. Now, when might that be? Well, again, Daniel 9, 27 talks about the Antichrist signing a peace treaty with the nation of Israel and giving a feeling of security to the nation of Israel and Middle East and to the world. And so there is a delusion that the day of the Lord begins with that it's peace and safety in the mind of the unbeliever, but the day of the Lord will overtake the unbeliever. Suddenly, unexpectedly, it will bring destruction, verse 3 says, by the way, destruction doesn't mean annihilation. Destruction here means that it will remove everything and ruin all that makes human life worth living. Sudden destruction. He says, in fact, it, it would be like a, a woman suffering labor pains. Uh, when a woman suffers labor pains, I mean, it's coming. The baby's coming. Uh, you can't Stop it. It's going to happen. 
like a woman in travail, like a woman suffering labor pains. It's inevitable and they shall not, it's an inescapable, this sudden destruction that comes with the day of the Lord. And then, really, the rest of the chapter, what he does, this third aspect of the day of the Lord to help us understand it that Paul shares with the, the Thessalonian believers, not only is, is it contrasted and then uh, does are the people informed, but thirdly, he differentiates. And I want you to see this very clearly, and I, I tried to bring it out already. He... He, he differentiated between children of light and children of the day and the opposite, children of the night and children of darkness. And I think it's vital to carefully observe the use of personal pronouns in the verses beginning with verse 4 down through verse 11. I've already mentioned some. Uh, even going back to verse 3, uh, they shall say, and uh, they shall not escape. Verse 4, ye, brethren, now he's distinguishing they from ye who are brethren. Pronouns, personal pronouns, they're important here. You, brethren, you, verse 5, ye are all children of light. Verse 6, let us not sleep, let us watch. Verse 7, they that sleep, meaning the unbeliever, they that be drunken, meaning the unbeliever. Verse 8, but let us, brethren. Uh, verse 9, we're not appointed, uh, God hath not appointed us to wrath. Verse 10, who died for us that we, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together, even as also ye do. So, see the distinction? See how the two are differentiated? The believer versus the unbeliever? That has to be understood here. The difference between a child of light and of day versus a child of night and of darkness. And that's what he says in verse 5. You're children of light, children of the day. We, there it is again, us believers, we're not children of the night. We're not of the darkness, okay? In verses 4 and 5, as he differentiates between the believer and the unbeliever, in verses 4 and 5, he tells us about our protection. Our protection. You know, back when I was a teenager, in the 1970s, there is a famous Christian movie called Thief in the Night. And it was a it was a, a, a film that uh, was used to awaken people to the rapture and how unbelievers would be left behind. But I want to tell you, as as you know, I'm sure God used that movie mightily. In fact, I know I, I had a friend that as a result of seeing that movie, it woke him up to seek God. But I want you to see that in the context here. The thief in the, in the night is not about the rapture. The thief in the night that's being described is about the day of the Lord. And we are told in verses 4 and 5, the wonderful thing is that though the day of the Lord comes undetected and uh, with great destruction, like a thief in the night, it won't overtake believers. Mm -hmm. That's what we're told in these verses. Look at verse uh, 4. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that the day should overtake you as a thief, because you're children of light. You're children of the day. You're not of the night. You're not of the darkness. And so believers are not going to be overtaken by this thief-like day of the Lord, you know why? One big reason. They won't be here. They're already be raptured. Before the day of the Lord begins, believers will be taken out. We caught up, as 417 says. We'll be caught up. 
with them in the clouds together to meet the Lord in the air. A pre-tribulation rapture is the reason why believers won't be overtaken by the day of the Lord. Because we don't belong to that time period. We don't belong to that dark night period. We are the children of light. We're the children of day. And then in verses 6 through 8, he makes some application based upon that wonderful truth that we're going to escape that tribulation period. That seven-year period of, again, I'm going to put it this way, hell on earth. We're going to escape it. And so, what should we do? Verse 6, therefore, let us not sleep as do others. Let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. They that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us, brethren, believer, let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. Now, how does he apply the fact that we won't go through the day of the Lord? Simple. Wake up. Wake up and watch. Not for the day of the Lord, but when he says, wake up and watch for his appearing. Watch for the rapture. Watch for the Jesus <clears throat> for his appearing. <coughs> be sober, he says. By the way, to be sober, it, it is a present tense. It's to be a continual attitude in our lives. We are to be sober continually. What does it mean? To be sober means to not be intoxicated. But it's not talking at that point about intoxication with alcoholic beverages. What he's talking about, don't be intoxicated with the world. Love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world. Don't be intoxicated by the glamour, by the pleasure, by the, the, the allurement of the appearance of the world. Instead, be diligent. And be vigilant, be on the watch, be on the lookout, because the rapture is imminent. The rapture can happen at any moment. There's nothing preventing it from happening now. So be sober. Wake up and watch for Jesus to appear in the sky, in the clouds. And he also says in that eighth verse, put on the whole armor. Put on the armor, he says, uh, of uh, the breastplate of faith and uh, love and a helmet of salvation. Put on the breast. You know, the breastplate was, he, he's thinking about Roman soldiers. Roman soldiers, they had a breastplate. And uh, they this breastplate would go over their, their torso. And uh, actually, we get our word thorax from that word breastplate. It, it went over their, their front and also covered their back as well. And so it's two-sided. And notice he says, put on the breastplate, and he gives two sides. The breastplate of faith and the breastplate of love. The breastplate of faith, I think, has to do with our inner attitude toward God, our dependence upon Him. The breastplate of love has to do with our outward, uh, um, I don't know, expression of that love, uh, which would be to others, to those around us. The breastplate of faith and love. And then he says, put on the helmet of the hope of salvation. By the way, you got to be sharp here and understand that every word in the Bible has to be interpreted again in the context. Remember I said the context is number one? Well, the word salvation here has to be interpreted in its context, the helmet of salvation. Salvation simply means deliverance, and it can be deliverance from different things. In the context, he's not talking about deliverance from sin. But in the context, he is directly referring to knowing your deliverance from the day of the Lord. 
That's the salvation he's talking about. Put on the helmet of salvation. Uh, uh, be confident in the rapture because it is before the tribulation. It is a pre-tribulation rapture. Be confident in that because that will protect your thinking. That will help you to not be discouraged and depressed about what is happening. You won't be here for that. So put on that that thinking of being delivered from the day of the Lord. That's what he's talking about. So that's the application. And in closing, verses 9, uh, 10, and 11, notice what he says here. <clears throat> he says, For God hath not appointed us. Who is us? It's the brethren. It's believers. It's the church. God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us. That whether we wake or sleep, whether we are dead or alive, we should live together with him. That's exactly what he said in verses uh, uh, 14 through 17 in chapter 4. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another. So he talked about protection. And then there was an application. And now in these closing verses, his emphasis is on edification. That is, spiritually building up each other through a comforting assurance of this truth and then a stimulating challenge that flows from it. That's how you build one another up. First of all, comfort, verses 9 and 10, is, is really a comfort. The world is destined to an appointment that God has arranged for them. And that appointment is the world is destined to the appointment of the day of the Lord. His judgment on this earth. God's wrath. But in verse 9, very clearly, the believer is destined to an appointment with God as well. But it's not the day of the Lord. The believer is not appointed unto wrath, the judgment of the day of the Lord. Rather, the believer, his destined appointment is to the rapture, to a day of grace, not a day of wrath. And again, I remind you that the word salvation in verse 9 has to be interpreted in its context. And it is specifically deliverance from the day of the Lord. That's what the salvation is referring to that Jesus will return for the church before the day of the Lord. The, tri the, the tribulation will happen after the church has been raptured. That's exactly what this church was praised for believing in in chapter 1, verse 10. Listen, that uh, you wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. And it's not merely the wrath of hell, but it's the wrath of the day of the Lord right here when it's connected with the rapture, when it's connected with the appearance of Jesus. It's deliverance from the day of the Lord. And so it's a wonderful comfort, isn't it? And he says then in verse 10 that whether you wake or whether you are living or whether you have fallen asleep in Christ, before the rapture. Doesn't matter. Both the living and the dead in Christ will get glorified bodies and both will enter into eternal fellowship with Jesus in heaven. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I'll come again. I'll receive you unto myself that where I am in my Father's house, there you may be also. That's Jesus' own promise of the rapture. That's the comfort in verses 9 and 10. Then there's the challenge in verse 11. He says, wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. It's a challenge to, again, diligence and vigilance. That if today is the last day before Jesus returns, then you want to spend it well. <laughs> How can you spend your last moment before the rapture well. Well, living the Christ life in active evangelism and discipleship, 
living a pure life. You know what John says? John says, beloved, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the children of God? And it doth not appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Therefore, he that hath this hope in him purifieth himself. So how do you live well if the rapture can happen at any moment? How can you spend whatever time you have left well? By living a Christ life. Live in purity. And live in faithful church attendance and in loving the brothers. You say, where do you get that? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25. And let us consider one another to provoke or to stimulate, to stir up in one another. Love, love for the brethren, and good works, service for the Lord. And forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, as the matter of some is, as you, uh, and so much the more, as you see the day approaching. What day is he talking about? The rapture. It can happen any moment, and you don't want to be caught not spending your life well. That's what he said. Faithful church attendance. Don't forsake the assembly. Loving the brothers. Encouraging and stirring them up to a right living. And serving. That's the challenge here. To the bottom line. Bottom line in all of this, if I can just tie it all together, is simply this. Every human being has an appointed time. It's a point end of the man wants to die and after that the judgment. But every human being has an appointment with God. Believers, when we're raptured, you know what? During that seven year period of the day of the Lord here on this earth, you know what believers will be doing? They'll be in heaven. But I think it's during that time that we will also at the beginning Stand before the judgment seat of Christ, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and receive or lose the reward concerning our service here. You can check that out yourself later. <coughs> but the lost, the lost will stand before the judge of all the earth at the great white throne, we're told in Revelation chapter 20. And, it, and it's, uh, I think, important to recognize, as Paul says, in that famous sermon that he gave before the, the uh, elite intellectuals in the city of Athens, that he said to them, as he closed their sermon, and some mocked when he did so, he said, God has now commanded all men everywhere to repent. Why? Because God has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. What man? The one that he raised from the dead. Meaning Jesus. So every human being has an appointment with God and will face the Lord. C.S. Lewis he said, and I quote, God's going to invade this earth in force. But what's the good of saying you're on his side when you see the whole natural universe melt away like a dream and something else and it never enters your head to conceive that this whole world has come crashing in something so beautiful to some of us and yet so terrible to others that no one will have any choice left. That is when God judges. For this time, it will be God who without disguise, something so overwhelming that it will strike either irresistible love or irresistible horror in every creature. It will be too late to choose your side. There is no use to say, you choose to lie down when it's become impossible to stand up. That'll not be 
the time for choosing. It'll be the time when we discover which side we're, we've really chosen, whether we realize it or not. He goes on to say, now today, this moment, our chance to choose the right side. God's holding back to give us that chance. It'll not last forever. We must take it or leave it. There's an appointed time when every human being will stand as an individual before the God of heaven. And it's vital to realize that Jesus hasn't returned yet because he's giving us all a chance to escape the day of the Lord. And that judgment, that impending wrath that it brings. So, let me ask you a question. The rapture is true, whether you believe it or not, it's true. You know, that's the thing about truth. Just because you don't accept it doesn't negate it. Doesn't mean it's not going to happen. Truth is truth, whether people believe it or not. So, the rapture is going to happen. How, what position does that put you in? Will you be left behind? How about this? Are you comfortable with the fact that some of your loved ones would be left behind? Does that sit well with you? Does that bother you at all? Even though you're sure you won't be left behind, what about your loved ones? Does, does, does that strike your heart at all? It's true. Well, how do you escape? Well, very simple, isn't it? It's all in Christ. He is the escape route, you might say. He's the only way of escape. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? And to escape is to realize that salvation is only in Jesus. And it's by realizing that there is no salvation in yourself or in a rabbi or in a priest or a Protestant minister or anyone else. There is salvation in one and one only. There is one God and there is one mediator, go between, between God and man. And that is the man Christ Jesus. And until you fully embrace him and what he has done and finished for you perfectly on that cross, you don't have salvation. You're not ready for the rapture. You definitely would be left behind. And that's not anything that you should want for yourself or anyone else to be left behind. I'm not saying that there will be no chance for people to be saved during the tribulation period. Many will be saved. But I don't think I want to take that chance. <laughs> and I don't think you want your loved ones to take that chance either, do you? No. And so, folks, let's get serious about this. This is the bottom line application of the rapture and the day of the Lord. Make sure that you're saved. And would you do your dead level best before God to rescue people before that great and terrible day of the Lord? as it's described in the scripture. God's spoken to your heart. Here's an opportunity to move, to act upon what he has spoken to you about. And I hope you will.